Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, particularly, um, this is not going to be particularly applied in regards to a, pre of a presentation. Um, I'm going to leave that to Troy. So Troy's presentation after this is going to be really um, the application of what I'm talking about. Today is going to be more about uh, a justification um, for why I do or what I do in my classes. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to throw you far out into the ocean, and that may not be the best strategy. Um, however, I will employ some strategies uh, to try to keep your head above water, and uh, I promise to reel you back in uh, by the end. If you have questions about terminology, stop me. Okay? If you have questions about what I'm talking about, please write them down and I'll address them during the question time. Uh, just because I, time-wise, I should be right about 45 minutes. Um, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start things off with a little bit of a different approach today. and I'm going to start off with just a quick, short story um, that I wrote. Um, <clears throat> Erica walked down the hall with composure, yet her head was down and slightly cocked to one side. Lost deep in thought, yesterday she had scolded uh, lost deep in thought. Yesterday she had scolded at least five different students for dozing off and not were not concentrating during class. She knew the kids weren't bad kids. In fact, she doubted even the existence of a bad kid. It was just that they couldn't keep they couldn't seem to help themselves. This made it worse. It made her feel as if she were inadequate as if she were failing them. It wasn't from a lack of effort on her part. She prepared. She mustered energy for class. She applied appropriate pedagogical strategies. As she approached her first grade, class, uh, first, first grade English classroom, the low roar of her students' banter grew. She turned and entered the room. The kids were too engaged in their immediate interactions to notice her entrance. Thirty-two kids yelled at each other, poked each other, talked about what had happened on the playground, giggled, made exaggerated exclamations, teased each other, and instructed each other on codes only pertinent to first grade adolescents. She thought to herself that her students' communicative competence and general knowledge were light years beyond what could be explained by one year of elementary school. How was it that these kids had learned so much in these early years of life before formal education? Why was it that she had to expend so much energy in class to achieve so few gains, all while losing a third of her students to boredom, to boredom or inattention? She stood and looked over her students. There has to be something here I'm failing to grasp, she unintentionally blurted out. The children didn't hear her, or at least paid no attention, and continued on in their social exchanges, at least until she decided to rein them in. <clears throat> okay, so, as conscientious educators, we all, I'm only gonna read for just a second, okay? I promise, and I'll go in my notes. Uh, but as conscientious educators, uh, we all want to improve learning outcomes for each, for each and every learner. Uh, we know the joy that comes from seeing learners excited and engaged in learning, uh, but we also see the pressure and the resulting stress heaped upon our youth in the name of performance. Um, it pains us to see the young suffer, particularly those who view themselves as lacking intelligence. And this is a shame, um, primarily because intelligence derived from one's DNA is basically a myth. Um, we unnecessarily and quite arbitrarily perpetuate a kind of cognitive genocide um, which, in the long run, I actually believe risks weakening civilization as a whole. Uh, and this is not a condemnation of educators. Uh, we try our best within the confines of the dominant industrial structure. Uh, department heads implore us to work harder to achieve better results, yet more of the same will likely yield the same results. Um, of course, garbage rolls downhill, so we, the educators, employ micro-strategies to motivate, even cajole, and manipulate our students to study more, work harder, think harder. Can you really even think harder? Is that even possible? Is it even possible to not think? Uh, learning is not a choice. Uh, it's a constant reality. If we weren't naturally inclined toward learning, then our species wouldn't have achieved all of this. Um, learning is enjoyable. It's what we do all of the time without exception. And I'll try to show you how. Uh, for me, my goal is for me, my goal is to facilitate real learning for all, including those highly principled individuals who are not always particularly motivated by extrinsic rewards like money, status, certification, or grades. At the end of the day, I'm looking to harness evolved learning processes that are as much a part of us as an opposable thumb. 
uh, and these processes survive because they are successful. Okay. Um, well, do I have it in my thing? Great. Um, do you think I could get somebody actually to operate this? Because I couldn't. Thanks. Because. Yeah, and I'll just tell you when I'll see next or something like that. Um, so my initial, I'm going to take this off, uh, my, uh, uh, next please. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Defending Humanity, that's my title, because Troy had such a nice title to his, I was like, it's competition. Um, uh, yeah, yours is better. Uh, so I have a real in, uh, first initial caveat, and this is just in regards to the differences between first language and second language. Uh, second language, the way that it um, that it manifests itself within the brain is basically exactly the same as L1. Okay, we like to think we're, we're talking about interlanguage problems, and there's certainly there are interlanguage problems. Um, so the, there are basically minimal neurological differences between L1 and L2. Um, this is uh, an fMRI, well, it's, uh, many fMRIs all combined together of bilinguals, and what we're doing is we're measuring the differences uh, between the uh, L1 usage and the L2 usage. And, and, and by the early bilinguals, uh, there is no difference in regards to how it manifests, the L2 manifests itself in the brain. You can see that there are differences that we do see in late bilinguals. These are uh, high proficiency late bilinguals. So there are uh, differences uh, here in the prefrontal cortex and in the parietal cortex. Um, and certainly, well, Maybe we'll see a little bit later, I might talk a little bit. But anyway, so when I talk about language here, I'm talking about language. I'm not going to differentiate between language one and language two. Next, please. Okay. Um, I really am taking an evolutionary perspective. And this is a big movement um, in a variety of fields. We see, for example, in economics, uh, they move towards beha uh, behavioral economics, which is essentially trying to accommodate for evolution within the field instead of these very elegant um, theories. Um, that really don't really sh manifest themselves uh, in the real world. Um, and so this is just basically saying is that not a single feature of any, even like as I stand here right now, and as you sit here right now, is like none of this can be explained, explained without evolution. Um, so ba that's basically what John Bowlby is uh, saying here. Uh, Bowlby is, you know, he's the guy who started the attachment theory kind of thing. But anyway, so I'm, I am really trying to lay out a real evolutionary argument for games and narrative in the classroom. Uh, next please. Okay, cognition and learning. There is no difference between cognition, there is no difference between learning. They are basically one and the same thing. Uh, cognition and learning are indistinct, evolved biophysical processes. Um, so, if you are alive, you are cognitive. If you are alive, you are cognitive, you are learning. Period. Right now, you are learning. I'd like you to try to stop learning right now. Go ahead and stop. Okay. It's not something that, that you actually even control. Um, so it's an evolved biophysical process, and here we're really focusing on the physical, and this because we're trying to get away from the dualism, right? The, I think, therefore, I am, and that's a good enough explanation, right? It, it, basically, you're invoking some sort of higher power, and we don't need to explain it beyond that. Um, so it's a physical uh, process, and I'll try to bring, I'll try to make this um, real for you in a moment. Um, it's also an action-oriented process. Uh, it's action-oriented and process-oriented, and this means that that. Um, and again, you know, we always throw out, you know, how many neurons you have in your brain. You have 67 billion, and this each one has 200 to two to 5,000 connections. So you're looking at, you know, 100 trillion neuronal connections. And these are your your neuronal synapses are these connections. A, a neuron, each neuron is firing roughly 10 to 100 times every second, right? And my point here, though, is just that learning cognition is a process. We need to stop thinking of it as in there's this kind of like end result to it. It's this ongoing action learning process. Um, I really recommend reading Angle, um, Where's the Action, the, the Pragmatic Turn in the Cognitive Sciences. Oh, yeah, and uh, with the word pragmatic today, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with the word pragmatic. In linguistics, pragmatic is how context brings meaning to language. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand it a little bit. Um, anyways, so action-oriented process, physical process, I'm going to use, for example, mitotic spindles. 
Okay, you have mitotic, right now you probably have millions of mitotic spindles in your, in your body. These mitotic spindles are um, these uh, microtubule structures that grab a hold of your, ex, of your chromosomes and pull your chromosomes apart during cell mitosis, okay, when your, cell, when your cells replicate. And these, these microtubules play a very, very important role in, 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 our, in our living function. And the, these things are not like, hey, you know what, let's go ahead and pull apart this X chromosome. But they do it successfully. And they do it successfully in a kind of statistical manner and through a, through a process of exploration and error correction. And, and here you can see these um, microtubule assemblies. And at any given moment, you can you can take a picture of it, and you'll see these microtubular assemblies. And if you take a picture, uh, you know, several, 100 microseconds later, um, most, the majority of the microtubule assemblies are going to have disappeared. And this is how it, how the process is that these things do not actually know where to go. What it is is that your chromosome releases what's called a RAN GTP gradient, and the RAN GTP gradient spreads out. It's more concentrated here, and it spreads out. Think about this as a context, okay? Is it allows the, the GTP one turn phosphate spreads out from here, and these and pro, this GTP actually provides a kind of bonding element that allows these other proteins to then bind together. And of course, where it's originating from is going to provide more of these bonding opportunities, and so hence the spindles. These microtubule spindles grow toward where the um, chromosome is. And just my, the reason why I'm putting this forward here is that we have this idea that, that, oh, I'm cognitive, I have intentions and goals, and these things are like I think of. And the point here is that it's, it's really much more of this kind of statistical process within a context. And it's learning is a process of exploration and error correction. I think, oh, what's his face? We just gave the previous previous presentation, he kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, and we also have prediction, and this is prediction via persistence. I'll give you a, a I'm going to make this hopefully very clear to you. Uh, next, please. Uh, can you please real quickly count the number of dolls on this page? Okay. Now, now, what I want you to think about is that notice about how when you were counting the dolls, a lot of what you're doing is that you actually have the very subtle motion movements within your tongue and also even within your auditory structure. And maybe even you may have even mentally kind of even used a finger. You may have repressed it because that's what a lot of our prefrontal cortex and our neocortex is about, is actually repressing automatic kind of gestures and, and actions. And so my point here though is just like in a, a cognitive process of counting, it is a physical process, it's a body-based process, it's distributed. You are actually using your vocal system to help you count. You're actually using your auditory system to help you count. These things are very integrated and tied together. Next, please. Okay. Um, and it's very action-oriented. Can you please read this? Okay, the cat in the hat, right? And, but at the same time, though, is that if we look, is that each H and each A are exactly the same. And my, the point here, though, is that we are constantly bringing predictions to every situation, every moment. And there's some really interesting uh, research that goes into this, uh, where they actually will, uh, next please, um, you know, like for example, this, this is actually playing with your prediction process. Um, I don't know, you guys can see black dots kind of appearing and disappearing. No? So, uh, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, um, but it actually do some, uh, some interesting research where they have this, uh, this kind of viewer that, you, that people put on their faces here, and so, um, our, our eyes, right, we're constantly kind of, co our brain is constantly coordinating the vision that's coming in from our left eye and our right eye. They have this thing that you put on, and it has an image, and both of the images have the same background, and one of the images will have a face, and the other image will have a house. And you're, you know, it's right here in front of you, you can't see anything else, and they'll say, what are you, what are you seeing? And the, and the people will say, oh, well, I see a house. Okay, now I see a face. Okay, now I see a house. And the, we are constantly bringing predictions forward, and I'll address actually why it actually switches back and forth. Next, please. 
Okay, so, of course, we know this. Learning is a neurophysiological process, right? This is just basically saying neurons, your brain, etc. Um, learning, we have our heavy and learning theory. Is everyone familiar with heavy and learning theory? The heavy and learning theory? Okay, it's, it's established, a long established actually, heavy and learning theory. It's really simple. It just means that neurons that fire together wire together. Neurons that fall out of sync lose their link. Is a kind of easy kind of meta or whatever you want to, to remember that. And this is just basically strengthening and weakening of neuronal connections. This is between various regions in the brain, local connections, um, some connections that extend out of local connections. And this means that basically that learning is an associative process. When we learn, we are basically just building associations between various neurons in our body. Of course, it's a lot more than that, but this is, that's the basic idea of heavy learning. Learning is unconscious, as I said before. Can you stop learning? Can you stop the firing of the, the, the several hundred billion synapses that just fired right now and that just fired right now? Can you stop that process? Completely impossible. It's an unconscious, learning is an unconscious process. It's not something that we control. Um, so this then changes our entire paradigm, the way that we approach education. So we want to focus more than on habituation via quantity of activity. Uh, practice, the same as riding a bicycle, the same as learning to hit a baseball. Um, any kind of learning is exactly the same as that, whether it's whether it be something like mathematical or engineering or social skills or writing, etc., etc., etc. And we have evolved systems of innate motiv uh, motivation. This is our dopamine and reward prediction error. Reward prediction error is related to what I was just talking about with uh, the eyesight. Next, please. Okay. Dopamine, uh, if, you, if you guys look up here in the top left, I'm kind of in, including a little icon that kind of shows you where we are on the evolutionary scale. So that's why before I was kind of showing you these kind of proteins um, and then kind of these neurological processes. Uh, now we're with insects. Uh, dopamine neurons are found in all mammals, reptiles, insects, birds. Uh, dopamine has significant effects on behavior, including motor control, learning, attention, motivation, decision making, mood re regulation. Next, please. <coughs> Next. Sorry, I did. Uh, maybe try arrow. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go back. I'm sorry. So the, we're, go back to the monkey. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so, sweet. Uh, reward prediction error. So these are really famous experiments with monkey induced experiments by Wolfram Schultz. And what they're, they have monkeys per performing a task um, in which they're, it's a learning task. And one of the things that they found was that these dopamine, um, do these dopamine neurons are not firing when the monkey receives the juice. It's firing actually before it receives the physical reward. And this is what makes us think that, oh, hey, there's something here going on that's actually a prediction of a reward, rather, and that the dopamines are actually reinforcing predictions rather than actual rewards. Um, and this is why one reason why gambling is probably so addictive, right, is because it kind of uh, successful gambling games are right on that kind of cusp of 50-50, but not quite 50-50. And it really kind of stimulates people to keep trying. Um, but, okay. So, as prediction of the reward becomes more accurate, as, as the, as this, go back to the thing that we were talking about, or that I was talking about, with the, uh, with the eyes, and the person seeing a house, but then it changes to, to a face. The reason why it changes is because your body, your brain is becoming accustomed to the prediction that it's making that, oh, this is a house. And then, so as it become, as the prediction becomes more accurate, these neurons stop firing. And then it will switch to the other one. And what this is, what we're really talking about here is we're talking about is that if we were motivated to learn things that were only easy, we would never have achieved all of this. And if we were only motivated to learn things that are really, really difficult, we would never have achieved all of this. You can think about Vygotsky's own proximal development, the way that we move forward. Is that we, these, these dopamine neurons are actually essential for kind of naturally guiding us to the most probable, the best, kind of providing us these kind of predictive models that, that guide us toward the best opportunities for learning. 
things that are not too easy, playing basketball against a bunch of kindergartners, it's not a lot of fun, not a lot of challenge in it, and things that are too difficult. I hate it when I play against people, games against these guys, and they're just way too difficult, they always win, I want to quit. Next, please. Um, and one of the reasons why this is so difficult to look at is actually because it really messes with your prediction um, uh, reward error in, in your visual, visual cortex. Uh, and it's because we're kind of evolved to look at people's eyes. Next, please. Okay, learning is an emotional process. And we completely forget about that often. Uh, learning is an emotional process. We look at glucocorticoids, which are stress hormones. Uh, these affect memory consolidation and memory retrieval, uh, positively and negatively. So this means that when people have a lot of stress, we see that like our ability to recall information kind of shuts down um, when people have too much stress. Uh, this has been replicated in humans and also, of course, in many other lab animals. Um, but then also that we actually need a little bit of stress. Is that you have no stress, um, actually also inhibits uh, your ability to remember things as well. It's interesting. This, again, you'll see this kind of balance of um yang going on uh, throughout the entirety of the presentation. Uh, emotionally salient experiences enhance retention of, ex of other experiences. I will never forget the day that I broke my collarbone. I'm not going to forget it. It was so, I mean, I could, even now when I even think about it, uh, it, it kind of makes me kind of sick to my stomach. That these emotional experiences have, it's related to the amygdala, which is in our limbic system, which I'll talk a little bit about. Well, actually, okay, I'll talk about it right now, because the limbic system is actually what's referred to as the reptilian brain. So you have your brain stem connected with your cerebellum. That's kind of real basic brain structures. And then it grows forward from there. We have our limbic system. This is what we call our emotional system. We have uh, a lot of it is related to memory. Um, such as the hippocampus, which is a, uh, an amygdala, which is memory with emotions, which then kind of moves on to the pituitary gland, which releases hormones into our bloodstream. These things are kind of operating together in sync. Uh, but anyways, uh, what was I talking about with that? Um, emotions. This, this emotional uh, system is very tied with memory. That's it. Uh, emotional, <laughs> emotional states that do influence people's ability to solve problems. Uh, it's, it's really, some really interesting research on that as well, famous kind of stuff. Um, okay, now let's get to learning as a sociocultural process. Um, and I'm just going to divide this into two sections, and I'll keep it, I will keep it really brief, because I think I'm doing really well with time, pretty well. Um, so we've got neurobiology, linguistics, and knowledge. Uh, this kid, um, that is absolutely, of course, a, um, that's definitely a semiotic behavior, right? There's definitely meaning in that. I would guess that contextually, he's probably doing it at a very appropriate time, probably the same time that his father would do it as well in a match. Um, and we might say, oh, he doesn't really know what it means. It's like, well, you know what, you know, where does meaning even come from? How do we really know everything? It's always kind of contextual, right? Thank you. Uh, next, please. Okay, so. We have neuroendocrinology, which we were talking about the limbic system. The limbic system is created, is associated with, with hormones, emotions. This is very connected with our system of memory. Um, we have neuropeptides like vas vasopressin and oxytocin, uh, which orient mammals towards social interaction and bonding. For example, my oxytocin levels are much higher than yours, and much higher than yours, and much higher than yours. And probably not. Uh, we're probably more similar because we have young babies. Uh, when uh, when a, a, uh, our pair gives birth to a child that is our own, we actually, um, our testosterone levels drop off. I had low testosterone levels to start with, but our testosterone levels drop off, and uh, uh, our oxytocin levels in, in, uh, rise dramatically, and this has a lot to do with the, with the process of them orienting me towards uh, those kind of baby talk and things like that, holding and cuddling with my baby, and actually wanted her to be here with me in this part of the presentation. But next, please. <laughs> and it's a co-evolutionary process, and this is what a lot. This is where earlier when I talked about DNA and the way that DNA plays into this. Um, you guys, you have ideas of like intelligence, probably, maybe not, hopefully not. Um, intelligence is complete garbage. The idea of any kind of IQ is completely does not match with our understanding of evolution. 
and I'll try to make that clear. Uh, this is research by Robin Dunbar. Uh, he's looking at the neocortex, the size of the neocortex, which is basically the, the outermost realm of our brain. Um, I've, I've heard that it's the outer six most layers, but I'm, according to this image, it's a lot more than that. But anyways, um, and what, he's, what he found was that when he compared humans with other primates on a, a logarithmic scale, he found that, that the size of our neocortex in regards to its mass, the mass ratio of our neocortex to the, other, to the other parts of the brain fits very well in a relation to our average social group size. And this is in an anthropological sense, not a, not a modern societal sense. And humans in general move in groups of in the range of about 150, uh, anthropologically speaking, for hundreds of thousands of years. And what we found is that that actually matches quite well. And what, what this means is that our neocortex is actually, it's repressing behaviors. Because every time that Tim gets frustrated, if he was to punch somebody, kind of like how the um, baboons do, right, um, that's probably not going to be good for social cohesion. And then the social cohesion does not allow us to achieve quite as much. We need social cohesion. We need to work well in groups to be able to achieve everything that we have achieved, such as pilot a ship, build an aircraft, an airplane, right? But building an airplane at this point is completely impossible without a large variety of people. Next, please. I'm going to go to my notes just a little bit because um, I forgot where I am, actually. Uh, okay. So, Okay, yeah, so I'm sure, probably most of you have heard of mirror neurons, right? At this point? Yeah? Okay. Um, we find them in all primates, um, and some species of birds, and we will likely find them in all mammals. Um, and this is just a, a quote by Ramakandran um, and Auburn. And this is, this is, the discovery of the mirror neurons is very significant. And uh, I think Ioc uh, Marco Iacoboni, who's a head of neuroscience at UCLA, really puts it well as it, it's going to change the way that we can completely conceptualize of cognition of our mind. It really shows how interconnected our minds are right now at this moment. Next, please. So mirror neurons, um, we have, for example, an, ex an executed uh, reaching task or a grasping task, uh, hence the reason why I used the word there must be something I'm feeling to grasp here in, the, uh, in my initial story, was that you have a person who reaches, okay, or a lot of the research done with monkeys, is that the person reaches and we basically, we recognize, we, we measure the changes in the levels of activity in the motor cortex. The motor, motor cortex is associated with motor function. The ability to move. As I'm talking, that's a motor function. As I'm listening, that's a, somewhat of a motor function. Um, it is a motor function. Uh, uh, as I'm walking, it's a motor function. What we find is that when we are, when the monkey is completely restrained, ethically dubious, um, and the researcher reaches this exact same region in the monkey. Fires. And what that means is that the way that we understand what we are seeing is, is actually through our own body. Is that we replicate the actions of others, we actually replicate in ourselves. This is, um, so like when we see somebody who's really sad, we actually, are, we actually can kind of empathize. We can actually feel their, their kind of feelings. And what it is is we're actually recreating that within, our, within ourself. Um, uh, and, and in this particular study uh, by, I don't know, Nelson Film and Gavin Serrano, they even had imagined reaching. They had, this was actually done with humans, and they're having humans imagine that they're reaching. And we're finding that the way that our imagination operates is actually at a very physical level. Is that when I ask you to imagine reaching, you actually recreate the process of reaching with this, you actually recreate. Reaching, the only reason why you don't reach is because we have a pretty large neocortex, large prefrontal cortex that represses um, um, situations as it is within a social context. Um, next, please. Really? Is it that boring? <laughs> uh, okay, so anthropo- uh, I'll delete that out. Okay, so 
We, uh, this is actually looking at other animals, it's not humans, and I'm just going to summarize it because you don't want to read through all of it, but from an anthropological um, perspective is that they look at learning mechanisms in other animals, and what they find is that learning mechanisms in other animals um, uh, basically falls into these, you need to have a social other, you need to have a pragmatic task, an observation of behavior, and imitation. Go back to the idea of mirror neurons, mirror neurons are very connected with the with the idea of, of imitation, that we are imitating other people for us to be able to learn. And think about this from an evolutionary standpoint, right? Is that we don't want to learn everything because learning is a process of trial and error and essentially you end up eliminating a lot of people from your gene pool um, if everybody has to learn everything. So learning has to be a kind of social process because it then reduces how many people you're, you're losing to the system. And we'll see a little bit why this is. Oh, uh, can you maybe click the button here? Which one? Maybe. Hmm. Can you just try clicking? Where right here? Uh, maybe here. Uh, oh, never mind. Oh, it's okay. Uh, next. So, again, these mirror neurons are the foundations of inner subjectivity. Inner subjectivity is just the ability for us to basically enter into somebody else's mind. Can you click right here? Um, and we'll just do a quick activity, okay? Um, can you scroll down just a little bit? Okay, a little bit more. A little bit more. Okay, right here. So this is um, Paul Ackman. He's really famous for this. Uh, you guys, just real quickly, uh, which one should he click? Anger, sadness, disgust, or happiness? Happiness. All right. Oh yeah. Correct. All right. Um, anger, sadness, disgust, or happiness? Sadness. Sweet. And okay. Ah, asa. And then this one: anger, sadness, disgust, happiness. Disgust, I would say. Um, and actually, yeah. Okay, disgust. And actually, Paul Ekman actually asked him to um, make a face of as, as if he had just stepped on a dead pig. Uh, and that was the face he made. Um, and what he found is that we have actually these universals, these facial universals that are true across all cultures in the world. And the way that we can understand what is he feeling is that we actually recreate this in ourselves. It's part of our biology. It's part of who we are. Um, can you go back to the uh, presentation? Uh, Let's close it. Uh, it should make yeah. Okay, so you can next. So, when you look at this, um, especially okay, women, more so than men, but me, I have trouble not smiling, okay? It, it's part of us, it's part of our empathy, it allows us to coordinate our emotional states. Next, please. Um, okay, real quickly, we're just gonna, um, what color is this? Light is not right here. Ruby red. Ruby red, excellent. Um, what color is this? Okay. Okay, what color is this? Okay, okay, how about this? Okay, how about this one? Okay, so just the point here is that is that we have constraints, we can identify that there are a variety of colors, and you know, we'll get down to real kind of, you know, okay, this one's crimson and this one's maroon, right? Um, but these colors are real, but at the same time, though, where the color starts and where it ends is kind of fuzzy. And that's actually really, really important. Um, next, please, um, when we're modeling things. So now, we, because we, learning is a sociocultural process, we get to the idea of what's called uh, relaxed selection. And we're going to look at the example here provided by the White Back Moonia and Mangley's Finch. Um, and what relaxed selection is, and this is very connected with language and with knowledge. And what it is is that our linguistic ability is not likely connected to our genes. It's actually related to a degeneration of our genes. Um, so, for example, let's think about Damon. Damon is alive right now, uh, and that's awesome, and I have been able to successfully sexually reproduce my genes. What's up? Okay. But, now Damon, I have really bad teeth. Okay? I have really bad teeth. These teeth are all fake. I have bad eyesight. 
probably a long time ago, I would not have been able to successfully sexually reproduce my genes because I would have been eaten by a tiger or a panther or a puma or something like that, or I may not have been able to eat the meat uh, that would have allowed me to survive uh, for, and, and get as much nutrition as to allow me to outcompete other people. But because our sociocultural system has evolved, what it does is it relaxes the role of genetics, is that people like me can continue to survive. And it brings a greater diversity and a greater cognitive diversity that actually allows our, our species to thrive. And again, a great example is that we basically cover this entire planet. We cover all continents. We even have a space station that's been, you know, we have humans living on for the last, you know, 10 years or more. Next, please. So what they found with these Bangley's finch was was that um, the Bengalese finch has been domesticated in Japan for the last 300 years. And it's been bred for the color of its feathers. Song is very important to birds being able to sexually reproduce, to be able to perpetuate their genes. But here we've taken and we've, we've domesticated that process, and we've eliminated song from playing a role in that process. Now it's just the color of the, of the bird's feathers. We really want white feathers, so we get this very white bird, the Bengali finch. Its wild cousin, or it, not even cousin, basically wild equivalent is, a, is the white-backed munia, which has a tuft of white on its back. This one, we can look at its song structure. Here's its song structure, A, B, A, C, D, E, F, G, A, H, B, A, C, D, E, F, G. There's actually very little variability in it, and that's because Natural selection continues to play, and sexual selection continues to play a very, very strong role um, in this species, and and that means that the DNA is tightly constrained. Whereas when we get uh, this bird that has been domesticated and song no longer plays a role, or my teeth no longer play a role in me being able to survive, or my eyesight no longer plays a role in me being able to survive, what it happens? I'm sorry. Can you go one back? Is that here are the the, the pathways associated with the wild bird in song production, and what happens is that these pathways actually become kind of eroded because the genetics become eroded. And it opens up the ability for us to then begin to achieve associations between various regions. And again, when, earlier when we did the counting, remember that the counting is that you were associating your body, your, your your body um, action, along with your hearing, along with even actually vocal production. That's part, that's actually language, knowledge. These things are distributed within the brain. And it actually comes from an actual devolution or a, a degeneration of our genetics. Okay, so you can begin to see how like knowledge and language are not actually any kind of genetic predisposition. There are certain special cases, cases where you, you get like kind of savant kind of capacities on certain genetic variations, but those are few and far between. Next, please. Uh, and then, um, yeah, if you, uh, go back, I'm sorry. Uh, if, you look, uh, if you look here at the variability, you see that these birds actually have a great deal more variability, and this variability um, is actually much more social, socially coordinated between the birds. So they'll, so they'll have a, a group of, of Bengalese finch that have been domesticated for 300 years in another group, and actually their song structures are quite different, but they're all kind of very similar within their group. It allows us a coordinating process. Next, please. Okay. Natural language games. Mothers, fathers, we play language games all the time with our kids. The mom says, what is that? And the infant says, da. And the mom says, yes. And the child says, da. Yes, flower. And the infant says, da. And the mom says, yes, flower. And this is an example of a very simple but very common language game played by uh, adults with, with parents. Can we do it naturally? Next, please. I'm going to skip over this part, um, but we, we've replicated this uh, using computational models with, with robots. This is just for testing the theory. That's all it's for. It's just for testing the legitimacy of the theory. We found that, that language games are actually, with physical gesture, are a necessity to go from non-language to language. Because we have to be able to get from no language to language. Next, please. And it allows us to coordinate perceptual categories. That goes back to earlier when I say, what color is this? You guys say blue. I say, what color is this? And then even it becomes, over time, it becomes much more nuanced. So we have to get aquamarine, um, cyan, or whatever. 
Uh, Simon Kirby did this really cool research um, on biological constraints and pragmatic constraints. Now I'm getting to the end of the presentation, okay? And uh, he had people playing a, uh, what he's trying to do is he's trying to create an artificial, he's trying to artificially replicate the evolution of a language, uh, which is very difficult, right? Because it's very ethically dubious for us to do this kind of experiment um, on people. Um, and also the time horizons make it financially infeasible. Um, but here's what the language game was is that we have these symbols, which is, we'll just say meaning, okay, a kind of sensor motor meaning, as you can see it. And then we have a computer that randomly generates syllables to go along, syllables or phonemes to go along with each syllable, or with, with each symbol, okay? And so the computer generates these random connections, and a person will sit there, and they will have, they'll be shown the image, and the word that goes with it, okay? And they'll sit there for like 20 minutes to learn the language, okay? Then, they then test the person on the language. Say, okay, what was the language? And the person says, oh, they show them the image, and they go, okay, what's, what's the word for this? And, and the people are horrible at this. They get 0%, okay? Then what they do is they take the person's answers, which are completely incorrect, and they use that as the foundation for the next person. And the next person comes in, and the next person does the exact same um, experiment and gets usually 0% or 5% or really poorly. And they take that person's answers, and they then use it for the next person. And what, what they found was that it evolves. Now, in their earlier experiment, they found that it evolves to, base, to, to basically you have like one word. So this is GABA. GABA, GABA, GABA. But what we're, what we're seeing here is that language adapts, language evolves to be learnable to the next generation. Language evolves and language adapt, adapts to basically fit our neurobiology, our evolved neurobiology. So what they did next is they had, instead of just doing, okay, one person doing an independent task, what they did is they had two people, they learn the language, and then they play a game. And in this game, the person uh, has a symbol, and then that person then has to say the word to the other person, the person has to choose the correct symbol. What they found is that by playing the game, instead of everybody just basically saying GABA, GABA, and getting 100% correct, was that the game actually forces us to be more expressive. It compels us, so we get this kind of balance between learnability, simplicity, and expressibility to be able to complete the task. And then what we get, you can see this is with a, a closed group, which I won't go into exactly what that is, but if you look here, you can see that this picture here has ege wa wu, this one is ege wa wa, this one's ege wu wu, this one's ege, this one's mega, and you can see that there are these kind of shared shapes, and that was probably the ege, Whereas these ones have shared shapes, so that's the me or mega, oh, I'm sorry, the mega, except for this one got, for whatever reason, and they're, they're doing multiple times of doing this test on multiple experiments, um, and they're finding is that, that we, that the, you can see that the, the structure actually evolves, and the structure organizes to fit our neurological architecture. So it's not that we need to learn language, it's actually, in some ways, the language actually adapts to us. Next, please. Uh, can you play the play, please? And I'd like you to just tell me what you see uh, after um, <laughs> gratuitous advertising. Uh, yeah, and we'll just leave it on the small, it's fine.
Okay, so what did you see? Triangles and circles. Okay, did anyone see anything different? Triangle and circle triangles escape, escape the big triangle. Okay, any, any, did anyone see like a boy and a girl? Possibly. I can see a bully out of the big Okay, maybe a bully. Okay, so and, and out of a hundred people, um, you didn't get it. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, the way that we, it was just movements of triangles and circles, okay? But we frame it within a narrative structure, within a body based structure, and even within a social structure. Even though it's just, next please. And this is narrative. And so when we say narrative, we think about, oh, narrative is uh, very like, um, kind of fancy thing, and actually what it is, is it actually, narrative is actually how our mind works. We have what's called the theory of mind, this is our ability to attribute mental states to ourselves and to others, and um, uh, I want to just have a little bit of faith here, because we're short on time and I don't want to take the time to explain what theory of mind is and how we validate it. Um, but there's a meta-analysis by Mar, and he basically looked at um, over 40 studies, fMRI studies, uh, where they were testing for theory of mind using narrative and non-narrative tasks, tasks. And what they found is that essentially it's basically the exact same structure. Um, and what that means is that narrative, remember earlier when, when we were looking at the experiment with the language and how the language structures kind of evolve, the language adapts to fit our brain, narrative has evolved to fit our brain. In fact, it's kind of co-evolved with our brain. Narrative is what it is for me to be me, and it's this very social process, and it's a very biological process, that it's how our brains work. Next, please. Um, that's okay, because uh, I'm just going to give an example, but we'll just skip it, because we kind of, um, and uh, essentially I show you a picture, I'm going to give you some other pictures. And I was going to ask you what she was thinking, and then all of you were going to actually give me different answers, or theoretically give me different answers, because I was going to give you different pictures. Uh, anyways, next. Uh, back one more. This is what um, uh, Haven calls the make sense mandate, is that we always are making sense of everything, whether or not we're learning um, engineering, or we're learning math, we're always making sense of it within the structures that have evolved. And we use basically narrative structures body-based, socially, socially, culturally-based narrative structures to make sense of the world. Next sentence, please. Oh, well, actually, well I'll go back, actually, real quickly. Um, so person one says, where's John? Person two says, well, I didn't want to say anything, but I saw a green VW parked outside of Carol's house. And this is from Haven's book. Um, and if you look literally what people are saying here, this person says, where's John? Person two didn't even answer that. Person two says, I didn't want to say anything. Did person two want to say something or not want to say something? Then we're, we're seeing here how, how understanding actually comes from our entire, the totality of our existence in many ways, and the totality of our social existence, and we bring these predictions to every situation. Next, please. So we have narrative, um, and hopefully that's going to real quickly transition. I'll cut it just a second. Okay, I'm almost finished. Besides, the next per person speaking doesn't really care. Um, okay, so again, I already said this, uh, but it does confer an evolutionary advantage. It would narrative would not have survived this long if it didn't give us some sort of advantage. It facilitates effective and affective, which is emotional uh, learning via simulated via simulated learning. It allows us to coordinate our values and our social models and facilitates pro-social abilities and behaviors. Next, please. Uh, okay. And um, narrative is an evolved pragmatic task. Are there other evolved pragmatic tasks? Of course, we see play in a variety of animals, art, dance, music, ritual. Uh, and I would argue, actually, that the, uh, that the uh, Fury uh, volleyball tournaments would be an example of uh, modern ritual. Um, and games, next. And games have been around for a long time. This likely means that they are providing some kind of evolutionary um, advantage, given that they have existed for as long as they have. Next, please. Uh, and the benefits of being mechanics are basically social, 
um, and they often facilitate teamwork. They involve physical body, physical action, emotionally rewarding, involve uncertainty and experimentation, minimal consequences for failure, it relates to the previous talk you just saw, provide rapid and clear feedback, and they make quantities for habituation fun. And one more, please. And then click play, please. And um, so special thanks to Sean and Troy. Um, so students in my classes, this is, this is my applied part of the, of the presentation. Um, but students in my class, they choose English books of their own choosing. Uh, they're just instructed to, hey, choose something that's not too easy, not too difficult. And they, for the most part, orient themselves to that. Choose something that's interesting to you. Don't worry about making me happy. Um, in my classes, um, I never talk. I don't talk at all in my classes. The teacher speaks zero. And yet my students, over the course of three semesters, improve dramatically in um, their language uh, as measured by a closed test that's supposed to be statistically correlated with a TOEFL test. Um, so uh, they, and because I only get one day a week with these students, I don't get a lot of time with my students, so I basically, they read whatever they want. They read comic books, that's fine with me, as long as they're dedicating a quantity of time. And it's more interesting, you'll have some students that will actually do, dedicate tens of hours to reading every week because they enjoy the books so much. Um, it, if we had sound, you would hear the students all constantly talking in English. I do actually take points off for students speaking Korean, um, but I don't take points off for, for I, I never evaluate students' ability. I don't evaluate their, their, oh, that was the correct way or incorrect way, because the other students will automatically correct them. They provide the feedback, because there's only one teacher. Here we've got lots of teachers, lots of opportunities. Uh, and if you can just forward to the front of uh, me right back here, is that I brought, uh, actually right back here, I'm sorry, right? Yeah. Okay, so then what we do is we bring games into the classrooms, and the instructions to play the games are completely in English. Um, I brought some examples up here. Um, and my role is to, I'm there to help them, same as a parent, same as a father, same as a mother, who are the best teachers in the world, right? Think about how much of our lives have been influenced by them. And essentially, I'm just there to, if they have any questions, I help them. For anything at all, it's not a test. So students feel comfortable asking me questions. They feel comfortable taking risks, trying out different approaches, because there's no fear of failure. This girl is one of the worst speakers in the class. And she would continue to ask questions, and there's a lot of interaction. Okay, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it, Carol. Thanks for listening, you guys. I'm sorry about that.